So uh, I'm speaking as uh, someone who knows um, very little about neuroscience, and so this, to me, uh, was a great education, and so I want to uh, thank Stanislas uh, for, um, you know, for such, a, uh, such an amazingly interesting uh, lecture, and I'm just amazed at how much, you know, one is able to learn about the development of the brain through these, um, through these techniques. Um, so and I'm going to, you know, I, I guess I'm the, you know, one of the people talking about the society of the neuroscience and society here. So I'm going to, you know, try to connect up what I was uh, seeing and also in the slides with the ways that uh, people like me approach these issues. Uh, and I thought there were you know, sort of interesting, uh, you know, similarities and differences between the research that's done in neuroscience and the research that's done in the social, in the let's say non-neuroscience informed social and behavioral sciences. So we similarly studied life course development, including cognitive development, educational performance, educational attainment, and its impact on a variety of adult outcomes, including labor market earnings, health, marriage and fertility, political and civic participation, uh, and a host of others. Um, I, I, again, mostly not in um, concert with neuroscience, you know, though I think that's gradually uh, changing. Um, and you know, I think you know one the, the one main difference, and indeed, in some sense, the most sort of um, obvious to me difference uh, uh, in 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 what I what I saw and heard and learned in in the way we tend to focus our research is you know, we tend to focus on variation uh, rather than on central tendency. Um, now, it's apparent to me that neuroscientists don't ignore variation, but at the same time, the brain is so complicated that the it seems that the central effort. Uh, is to understand the central tendencies, that is, the mechanisms behind brain development. Um, so there's great use made of extreme variation, for example, the impact of strokes as an identification strategy, in effect, to understand neurological mechanisms, but the emphasis is on, on normal brain development. Social scientists, in contrast, are fundamentally concerned with variation. They observe uh, that children vary in school performance, in educational attainment, and more broadly in life chances. Uh, and they seek to understand why. They seek to understand the social mechanisms that create associations between the context that uh, children uh, grow up in, family, neighborhoods, and schools on the one hand, um, and educational and behavioral outcomes on the other. And social scientists are also fundamentally interested in improving outcomes. Uh, and they understand how difficult it is um, uh, to uh, do this in part because of the difficulty of establishing causation. Uh, they particularly understand the potential impact of genetic confounds. So twin studies show substantial heritability for cognitive performance in educational attainment. Um, I was at a conference a month ago where the third, gener this, I'll, I'll call it the third generation polygenic score for educational attainment was released um, and announced. And I happen to have a three-year-old granddaughter uh, and it was sort of amazing to realize that with this third generation polygenic score that was now available, it turns out that I can do a better job of predicting her educational attainment by doing a cheek swab uh, than I could by um, asking her parents about their incomes, which of course my daughter's their parents, so I, I know something, but that was sort of, that's astonishing. Um, but at the same time, and this is I think my, in my point, social science research shows that the environment clearly matters, and it matters substantially. Um, I, for example, note the results from a paper um, by Raj Chetty and Associates, some part of the uh, e Equality of Opportunity Project, which came out a couple of years ago that shows dramatic differences in intergenerational opportunity, depending upon which local commuting zone uh, one grew up in. So maybe more germane to the current discussion are the results of the famous Perry Preschool intervention of the 1960s in Ypsilanti, Michigan. The Perry Preschool intervention produced one to two, provided one to two years of high quality um, part day educational services and home visits for a group of poor three to four year old low income African American children with measured IQs that averaged 80. In contrast with a randomly assigned control group, the Perry treatment raised the IQs of these children to 95, though by the third grade their average IQ had fallen back to 88 compared with 87 for the control group. And yet these gains translated into better academic and labor market performance and fewer behavioral problems for these uh, children than the control group in adult life. Maybe this is because the peri preschool intervention improved attention skills or self-control or work habits or other behavioral skills 
or maybe through increased emotional support, it reduced the likelihood of mental health problems that would have otherwise hampered these children as they aged. We don't really understand the mechanisms by which this study worked, but we do have some understanding of the treatment itself and of the evidence, and also from the equally well-known Abbasidarian project, which took place a decade earlier. An another relevant uh, finding, it seems to me, and this again connects up especially to the last slide, which uh, Santa Fe didn't talk about, but I think is uh, you know, sort of important and worth discussing, uh, concerning the implications of this research for, um, uh, uh, for sorry, okay, for, um, uh, for education. So there's a, a large literature uh, in, um, in, in sociology and economics on, on teacher effects. Uh, where, you know, where the studies are often done quite rigorously and they effectively address sources of endogeneity. Uh, and they find that, you know, the, the teachers matter. The teachers which are one standard deviation better and the distribution of teachers raised uh, uh, student performance by 0.1 to 0.15 standard deviations, which is the equivalent of a half to a full year of gains in high school. Now these gains fade over time, but they can presumably be reinforced by a succession of good teachers. Similarly, the, the literature on tutoring has shown that with randomized clinical trials, that intensive tutoring over an academic year can raise the mathematics achievement of low-income ninth grade African Americans by two to three tenths of a standard deviation. And just to take a third example, recent evaluations of the No Excuses Charter Schools in Boston, New York, and Chicago find an improvement on math and language arts test scores by 0.2 to 0.35 standard, de standard deviations, which again is large. So the question that's always you know, present either explicitly or implicitly in these studies concerns the question of how can outcomes be improved for children who are growing up in less advantaged or outright disadvantaged environments. Uh, actually, this came up just yesterday in the New York Times, for those who may have noticed the new study by Chetty and Associates uh, on the likelihood of producing a patentable invention when you're an adult. Its probability, as it turns out, depends very much on mathematical ability as a child, but their study also showed huge environmental impacts, huge differences in the prob probability of achieving this for the set of children who score over the 90th percentile in the math achievement distribution as uh, third graders. And it's as a function of exposure to innovation through friends and neighbors and, of course, parents in ways that can't be explained in terms of genetic correlation. So these environmental effects on attention, on work habits, on mental health, on math or language arts achievement scores, or on the probability of inventing something that could be patented, presumably work through the brain. Uh, and this all begs the question of what can we learn from neuroscience that improves our ability to use environmental interventions to shape children's brains to fully bring out their human uh, potential. Um, you know, which brings me to my you know, last set of comments. So at the end of the slides that I was given to prepare my comments, which I think is the slide that was on the screen at the end, uh, Professor Dehane uh, outlined some major pedagogical principles for reading acquisition. Namely, and I'll, I'll read them, but you, you actually could say better than I, because I was just reading off the slide, the explicit teaching of grapheme to phoneme conversion rules, careful guidance of visual attention, active learning that associates reading and writing, and working on the transfer from effortful to automatic reading. And this guidance all connects back to the issue that I raised earlier about what it takes to be an effective teacher. Now, the teaching literature has established that teachers differ, clearly differ in their quality. However, it turns out to be a very difficult uh, to establish at the individual level who is or is not a good teacher. And it's also turned out to be very difficult to say the extent to which quality differences in teaching arise from different teaching styles or what these styles might be. Um, and it's maybe the case that at least for the early grades that neuroscience can offer a concrete guidance on the answer to this question. And this would be a significant development uh, that would further integrate the various disciplines to study education as well as provide benefits uh, for children and for society as a whole. And so I'd very much like to hear you know, your thoughts on that, on that last slide if you have time today. <laughs> 